The Edgar Allan Poe Museum in Richmond, Virginia is a must for all literature fans, displaying the world's most comprehensive collection of the proclaimed author's memorabilia makes this museum one of the top 10 stops in Richmond, Virginia. Richmond. Travel across America with me. The Poe Museum, Richmond, Virginia. You're almost there. It's located around the corner. There is easy on-site parking. And what is this? The oldest house still standing in Richmond? I wasn't expecting that. Probably built in 1737 by Jacob Eag. It has been restored and placed in the custody of the Edgar Allan Poe Shrine. Now, the Edgar Allan Poe Foundation. When you hear Edgar Allan Poe, you think of the Raven. And when you hear the words, the Raven, you think of Edgar Allan Poe. Let's delve in to this great American author. All right, we're around the corner at the entrance to the museum. It's open Tuesday through Saturday, 10 to 5. And on Sundays, it's closed Mondays, so don't show up on Monday. The four-building complex of the Edgar Allan Poe Museum offers a comprehensive view of the life and work of this great American author. Poe lived in Richmond for 13 years, longer than anywhere else in his life. However, Poe did not live in any of the buildings that make up the museum. Aww. All of his childhood homes have been demolished. Most were destroyed in the 1800s, before the museum was founded. Luckily, the museum salvaged many items from Poe's childhood in Richmond that you will discover in several of our exhibit buildings. It's going to be so exciting, and you'll want to wait till the very end to watch the bonus feature. It's called Know Your Poe. Don't forget to subscribe, and if you have... Thank you. Edgar Allan Poe, 1809 to 1849. Well, that means he was only 40 years old. Wow, what a shame. Edgar Allan Poe is internationally celebrated as the master of the macabre. His tales of terror, sorrow, and madness have instilled fear in the hearts of readers for nearly two centuries. Do you remember this gothic literature from high school? Did you have to memorize any of his poems? I did. Hailing from Richmond, Virginia, the writer created over a hundred short stories and poems, including The Telltale Heart, The Raven, and Annabelle Lee, and much more. Here in Richmond is where Poe wrote his first poetry, became engaged, began his career in journalism, got married, and wrote his only novel. Poe gave his final reading in Richmond just days before his mysterious death, and will see some items that he owned at the very end of his life. Wait till you see that. It's so incredible, amazing, and stunning, and crazy all at the same time. Poe moved often as an adult, but he spent more of his life in Richmond than anywhere else. Many places claim Edgar Allan Poe, but Poe claimed Richmond. Start your tour here. Enter the Enchanted Garden. And here's a map of the property. The four buildings, the shrine, and the Enchanted Garden. The first building is the Visitor Center and Gift Shop, and this is where your tour begins. And you will exit into the Enchanted Garden, which was completed in 1922 as a memorial to Poe. And you can see the shrine way in the background. But let's go in the old stone house. You know the one we saw the front door when we were walking from the parking lot that's located on 20th Street? You enter the back door of the old stone house, the birth of a poet. During Poe's lifetime, this building was home to the Eag family. The Eags probably built the house in the 1730s and were living here during the American Revolution when Samuel Eag served as commissary to the Marquis de Lafayette, the French general who helped George Washington defeat the British. Wow, that's a great piece of history. The main exhibit in this house introduces you to the young orphan, Edgar Poe, who grew up in Richmond under the care of his foster parents, John and Francis Allen. In this room, are pieces from Moldavia, one of Poe's childhood homes. As you can see, the Allens were wealthy, and little Edgar enjoyed the privileges of the elite Virginian lifestyle. Edgar Poe first arrived in Richmond at the age of one with his mother, Eliza Poe a traveling actress performing with the Placid Company. When she died here a year later, Poe went to live with the wealthy Allen family from whom he would take his middle name. But the Allens never legally adopted him, although Poe was devoted to his foster mother, Frances Allen. His relationship with his foster father, John Allen, was often strained. Allen accused Poe of deepest ingratitude and wrote that his only regret is the pity for Poe's failing his talents. Well, that sounds like a terrible thing to say. This guy became one of the biggest literary figures in the world. Maybe he didn't appreciate literature. Some people don't. Maybe he just didn't like Edgar. 
because he didn't do what he wanted him to do. I don't know. As they mentioned, the family was wealthy. And here are some decanters from the Poe's home and salt cellars and glassware etched with the letter A. This room was very crowded and many people were listening to the audio tour. I prefer just to read the signs and take photographs and read them later to understand better. When Edgar Allan Poe was a year old, his father David Poe Jr. abandoned his mother the famed actress Eliza Poe. Then tuberculosis claimed Eliza just one month before his third birthday. Edgar, his brother and sister were separated and raised by different families. Edgar grew up with the childless Allen family in Richmond. Edgar Allan Poe is buried in Baltimore, Maryland. And when we tour that city, we will certainly go to his grave. We found his mother's grave not far away at the St. John's Church. This church is so historic. Have you ever heard of Patrick Henry? Wait till I do the video on St. John's Church. It is definitely one of the top historic sites to see in Richmond, Virginia. But this is where Elizabeth Arnold, the mother of Edgar Allan Poe, is buried back inside the old stone house. This is Poe's boyhood bed. One of his boyhood friends recalled that Poe's greatest fear was that he would awaken at night to find that someone was watching him from the darkness. Something had to start all this, didn't it? We saw this bust of Edgar Allan Poe, and this was truly incredible. Rudolph Evans made this bust in 1909, three decades before he sculpted the massive statue of Thomas Jefferson for Washington, D.C.'s Jefferson Memorial. Rudolph Evans created this bust in observance of the centennial of Poe's birthday. He based the likeness on the iconic Ultima Thule daguerreotype on display in the Poe Museum's Memorial Building. Evans cast only two copies of which this is one. A daguerreotype, an early kind of photograph made on a chemically treated plate. And I'm sure you were waiting to see this. Irons from Poe's childhood home. I don't see the uh, plug, do you? I don't see the wire for the plug. And what is this over on the other side? The ceiling wax lamp? What's that? The dark substance in the bottom of the tubes on the sides of this lamp is ceiling wax. Once John or Francis Allen or their foster son Edgar Poe finished writing a letter, they would fold the paper and seal it shut with hot wax. This lamp was used both to melt the wax and to light the writing desk. All right, let's go back outside. Look at this gate. We're heading from the old stone house, not far, just a few steps to the memorial building. Named in honor of Poe's mother, the Elizabeth Arnold Poe Memorial Building was constructed in 1928. It was built around the staircase that was salvaged from one of Poe's childhood homes. What? Some of its bricks on the exterior walls were salvaged from the Southern Literary Messenger. And we'll find out what is the point of the Southern Literary Messenger and its significance. And the Ellison Allen firm, co-owned by Poe's foster father, John Allen. The exhibit is dedicated to Poe's career, which includes several first editions of his writings and personal letters. Simply incredible. Remember I mentioned this is considered the world's best and comprehensive collection of Poe material in the world? Let's go in. The Life of a Literateur, 1832 to 1848. Poe is primarily associated with horror, but he also created the modern detective story, exploring science fiction, fantasy, poetry, and literary essays. Don't stereotype. Here is Poe's chair. Poe sat in this chair while editing The Southern Literary Messenger in the magazine's office about five blocks from here. Among the works Poe composed on this seat are King's Pest, Autography, and the first chapters of his only novel, The Narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym. Post boss is said to have cut down the back seat to make it less comfortable. <laughs> I had a boss one time that I think he would have done that if he would have known that idea to make things a little bit more uncomfortable. Did I say that? Yeah, well, I did. Mm -hmm. Have you subscribed yet? Please subscribe. Hope you're enjoying this. There's so much more. And don't forget about the bonus. The bonus. The one that the raven's going to tell us some cool things about Poe. But what is this raven thing? Well, the raven is a poem that catapulted Poe to literary stardom. Although the author received only $15 when it first appeared anonymously in the February February 1845 issue of the American Review. He soon made considerably more each time he performed The Raven to sold out concert halls up and down the East Coast. Oh, can you imagine going to one of those? From Europe. British poet Elizabeth Barrett Browning wrote Poe that his poem had created a sensation in her country. Soon Poe was nicknamed The Raven, and adoring fans followed him down the street, croaking the poem's refrain of, 
Nevermore! And in the museum were copies of Poe's writings, open to the raven, in many different languages. Poe's bride. I think he had a few relationships. Let's see. One of the most controversial and least understood aspects of Poe's life is his marriage to his, oh get this, 13-year-old cousin, Virginia, when he was 27. You know, it's crazy, but back in that time frame, a lot of older men married these teenage girls. When he secured employment at the Southern Literary Messenger, now see, we're talking about that messenger again, that place where the bricks came from? Poe brought his widowed aunt Mary Poe Lamb and her daughter Virginia to Richmond. Huh, funny, Virginia, Richmond, Richmond, Virginia. I'll back, I'm sorry, and married the latter in a house about eight blocks west of here. It was initially a happy marriage in which the trio enjoyed playing music, planting flower gardens, and the company of their tortoise shell cat, Katerina. Even Poe's enemies praised Virginia's air of refinement and good breeding. She spoke Italian fluently and composed poetry, including the touching tribute to her husband. Unfortunately, tuberculosis left Virginia invalid for the last years of her life and brought her death at the age of 24. They have some of her personal items at the museum. On Valentine's Day in 1846, Poe's wife gave him a poem in which she pleaded with him to take her out of the city to live in a country cottage where the fresh air might heal weakened lungs. Poe moved his family into this cottage a few months later, but the rural setting did little to cure his wife's tuberculosis. He probably should have taken her to California. So, she succumbed to the disease less than a year later. This painting shows Poe's cottage in its original setting before the countryside gave way to urbanization. The happens today, doesn't it? Poe's wife, Virginia, was not the only woman in his life to die young. Among these were his mother, his foster mother, and his first love, and his wife. In the days when tuberculosis raged unchecked and when one in six women died after giving birth, women's life expectancies were much shorter than today, and the deaths of young women featured prominently in the popular novels and poems. Poe considered a woman's death the most poetic topic in the world. While he was not alone in writing about death, Poe's poetry on the topic is unique and that it's still being read. The Raven, Annabelle Lee, Lenore, and The Sleeper are among the best-known poems in the English language. In Poe's days, newspapers carried dramatic accounts of frantic cries emanating from freshly covered graves, while the chances of being accidentally buried alive were minuscule. The terrified public purchased special coffins equipped with bells. The occupant could ring to call for help. You ever heard of that saying? That's a dead ringer? That's where it comes from. Here is this uh, armless, handless statue of Poe. Fifty years after the Poe Memorial Association first attempted to build a statue of Poe in Richmond, retired physician George Edward Barkdale took matters into his own hands. Looks like he took one of Poe's hands, too. And commissioned this monument, which he donated to the Commonwealth of Virginia in 1956. This is the plaster model for the bronze version that now stands 10 blocks from here on the northwest corner of Capitol Square. Capitol Square and the Capitol, one of the top things to do in historic Richmond. Do you think I saw the Poe statue or not? You'll have to wait till I do the video on Capitol Square to find out. They have a copy of Poe's horror masterpiece, the first printing of the Tale Tale heart. It says that when he was editing the Southern Literary Messenger, you know the place where they got the bricks from, Poe gave this sterling silver nail file to his favorite proofreader, William T. Richardson, to thank him for his assistance. Boy, you can't replace a great proofreader. They're worth more than a nail file, for sure. Poe heard this watch ticking in his pocket while he wrote the Telltale Heart. That's cool, that's his pocket watch. Before the word detective entered the English language, and 46 years before Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's fictional detective Sherlock Holmes made his first appearance, Poe invented the detective story with the murders in the Rue Morgue. The tale introduced Poe's fictional detective, Auguste Dupin, who returned for two sequels, The Mystery of Marie Roger and the purloined letter. Decades later, Conan Doyle asked, where was the detective story until Poe breathed the breath of life into it? Poe based his fictional French detective Auguste Dupin on a real-life French detective. Eugene Francois Vidoc, who is considered the father of criminology. This place had so much information. It was incredible. You could spend hours and hours reading all the signs and absorbing the information. And I just wanted to give you a taste because there's so much and it's hard to draw the line. But there is still so much more. We haven't even gotten into his early death. Remember, he'd only lived to be, what was it, 40? Maybe it was even 39. I didn't do the math. The 19th century saw the introduction of seemingly amazing technologies and the 
discovery of new worlds, including Antarctica. Poe was fascinated with science, technology, and their impact on the world, so he incorporated these into his fiction. He wrote about space travel, time travel, new invention, and the future. Along the way, he was the first to write about cyborgs, and he described a trip to the moon over a century before it was possible. Isn't that interesting? Because we don't think of Poe and those topics. We think of H.G. Wells and Jules Verne when you talk about science fiction. Poe preceded these men. And they have this photograph of Poe without a mustache and an 1841 manuscript of his autobiography. This is the only autobiography Poe ever wrote. Unfortunately, much of it is a lie. Poe begins by misrepresenting his age to make himself seem younger than he really is. Here is Elmira Shelton's engagement ring from Richmond, 1849. Shortly before his death, Poe gave this simple gold engagement ring to his last fiance, Elmira Royster Shelton. Engraved Edgar on the inside of the band. The ring cost so much that Poe was unable to pay his hotel bill and had his luggage confiscated as a result. Her house is around the corner from St. John's Church. Well, it's not her house anymore. It's a private residence. Poe launches his career at the Southern Literary Messenger. These bound volumes of the Southern Literary Messenger contain the early tales, poems, and reviews with which Poe established his name in the magazine business. Although Poe's experience editing the Messenger catapulted him to fame editing magazines in Philadelphia and New York, he found that the drudgery was excessive, the salary was contemptible, the 17 months he worked there were the longest time he would hold a magazine job. This was the main reason, well, I don't know if you can really say that, but it is one of the coolest things to see in this memorial building. This staircase was taken from Poe's childhood home at the corner of 14th Street and Tobacco Alley. Speaking of Tobacco Alley, You'll want to watch my video on the tobacco plantation. It is so interesting, the history of tobacco. Do you remember the old cigarette machines? You'll have to go watch the video. Poe lived in this house with his foster parents, John and Francis Allen, from 1822 until 1825. Hearing that the structure was about to be demolished, the Poe Museum's founders acquired the staircase and used it in the construction of this very building. And yes, you can walk up the stairs, and we did. There's a reading room up there. Edgar Allan Poe, 1809 to 1849. Yes, he predates Verne and Wells. This American poet and short story writer was known as the pioneer of the modern detective story. Even though Poe's life was marked by streaks of bad luck and tragedies, his works have been considered some of the finest pieces ever written. In 1845, The Raven brought him immediate fame. Eccentric and wild, Poe's writings were original and remarkable. This document is from Poe's essay, The Rationale of Verse. Next, we're heading to the North Building. This building was constructed in the late 19th century and acquired by the Poe Museum in 1927. The museum originally used it as a tea room. That sounds like fun. But after a recent series of renovations, the building was utilized as exhibit space. This building is dedicated to investigating Poe's mysterious demise. Five days after leaving Richmond on a business trip to Philadelphia, Edgar Allan Poe turned up semi-conscious in a Baltimore polling place on election day, dressed in someone else's clothes and with no recollection of the past week's activities. Wouldn't you call that amnesia? An editor named Joseph Snodgrass sent Poe to a nearby hospital where Dr. John J. Moran attended the poet. Poe's memory never returned. He passed the next four days conversing with imaginary figures and spent his last night in a violent delirium. The only clue Poe provided was the name Reynolds, which he shouted repeatedly during his final hours. There are at least 26 published theories about the cause of Poe's death. Brain lesions, phrenitis, illuminating gas, alcohol, beating, cooping, epilepsy, nervous prostration, meningitis, heart disease, early childhood trauma, diabetes, hypoglycemia, toxic disorder, brain hemorrhage, mercury poisoning, pneumonia, Alcohol dehydrogenase deficiency, porphyria, delirium tremens, rabies, syphilis, murder, chronic CO exposure, brain tumor, tubercular meningitis. Sorry if I butchered a few of those terms. This room was even smaller and just as crowded, if not more. This lavish but well-worn waistcoat is evidence that Poe dressed in the fine clothing of a Virginia gentleman, even when extreme poverty forced him to survive on bread and molasses for months at a time. But one could see signs of poverty in the well-worn clothes. After Poe's death, the socks and waistcoat went to his mother-in-law, Maria Clement, who in turn 
turn left them to her niece, Eliza Herring, whose great, great, granddaughter donated them to the Poe Museum. Well, that was nice of them. Thank you. Kind of pretty, isn't it? We're winding down, but there's a few really cool things. And of course, the Raven bonus, the Raven's tidbits. Bits of trivia, Edgar Allan Poe's trunk. This trunk contained most of Poe's worldly possessions. You know, it's kind of sad. It just all got boiled down to a trunk, including his clothing and manuscripts. But he left it at Richmond's Swan Tavern, which had confiscated it for lack of payment. Poor guy. And then they have the key to Poe's trunk. Said to have been found in Poe's pocket after his death, this key opens the trunk on display in this gallery. The question of why Poe would still be carrying this key if he were found in someone else's clothing remains unanswered. So he was found in someone else's clothing, but his key was in it? Who knows? It is mysterious, isn't it? On his last night in Richmond, Poe left this walking stick a few blocks from here at the home of Dr. John Carter. The doctor said that Poe left around midnight carrying Carter's sword cane and stepped across Main Street to Sadler's Restaurant. Very early the next morning, Poe boarded a Baltimore-bound steamship never to return. Winding down. Poe's boot hooks. Edgar Allan Poe used these hooks, a common gentleman's accessory, to pull up his boots. On his last visit to Richmond, shortly before his death, he left them at his sister's house. It's like he was leaving things everywhere. I wonder was he getting absent-minded or leaving them scattered around on purpose. Death of a poet. When his attending physician asked the dying poet if he had any friends who could visit him during his final days, Poe gave him an answer, but it wasn't a very good one, and I'm not going to read it. You can read it yourself. While the hospital staff tried to comfort him, Poe alternated between periods of violent delirium and rest. On his last night, Poe repeatedly screamed the name Reynolds, but this Reynolds has never been identified. Early the following morning, Poe allegedly uttered, Lord, help Help my poor soul before dying at the age of 40. Oh, so we do know he died at 40 and not 39. The cause of his death has never been determined, but his attending physician described it as inflammation of the brain and phrenitis. In 2002, in an attempt to solve the mystery of Poe's early death, Albert Donne, an environmental health engineer in Baltimore, analyzed a sample of Poe's hair for the presence of heavy metals that may have contributed to his final illness. A buildup of heavy metals like lead or mercury can lead to illness or death. Possible sources of heavy metal exposure in Poe's era included drinking water, alcohol, food, cosmetics, patent medicines, and illuminating gas lighting, which was made from coal. Since the accumulation of metals in hair varies with exposure, and over time, the researchers analyzed the two ends of each hair sample separately. Fragment of Post Coffin. Buried October 9, 1849. Unburied November 17, 1875. 26 years after their burial in an unmarked grave, Post's remains were relocated across the cemetery to the spot on which his monument now stands. During the move, the coffin fell apart and this fragment was taken. According to those present, the flesh and funeral robes had of course crumbled into dust. The skeleton was in good condition and the arms lying as they were arranged in death and the back and leg bones in a natural position. The teeth looked pearly white and were in excellent preservation. And here is Poe's last portrait. The Tank Ten Time. I mentioned this earlier in this video. Two weeks before his death, Poe sat for this last photograph in a studio about nine blocks down Main Street from here. Now, the bonus feature. Know your Poe. Expelled from West Point for gross neglect of duty and disobeyance of orders. Did you know he went to West Point? I didn't know he went to West Point until I read this sign. Know your Poe. When he was 15, Poe swam six miles in the James River, a record that still stands. The James River is the large river that Richmond was founded on. Know your Poe. Poe was born in 1809, the same year as Abraham Lincoln and Charles Darwin. So those are his contemporaries. If you look very closely at Poe's knife, you will see his name engraved on the handle. Back outside, located at the back of the garden and dedicated to the memory of Poe's life and legacy, the shrine is made of bricks and granite salvaged from the demolished offices of the Southern Literary Messenger, the magazine at which Poe began his career in journalism, formerly located at 15th and Main Street. The bust located in the shrine is a copy of one donated to the Poe Museum by the Bronx Historical Society. Society. The original bust was stolen from the shrine and found several days later in a local bar. I don't know whether to laugh or cry at that one. Please leave a comment below. And about not marking on the bust, I think it's too late. Flip-flops on the ground. Unclassic road trip. Please subscribe.